In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. To Cannabis Conundrums, a discussion here on medical versus marijuana. All the hoopla and all the information that's out there, a lot of terminology review and really the whole gamut of everything that we're going to really need to know as healthcare professionals when it comes to everything cannabis. But first, of course, uh, anyone and everyone would want to know a little bit about the person with the mic, right? Uh, so my name is Mark Rofley. I'm a, a clinical assistant professor and director of experiential learning for uh, our WVU School of Pharmacy. Uh, and also a faculty member in our WVU School of Medicine Pain Fellowship Program, uh, and of course a clinical pain management pharmacist at our WVU Medicine Center for Integrative Pain Management. Uh, so back in the day, I got my PharmD from Pitt, so yes, uh, walking backyard brawl per se, um, and then uh, I got an MBA from Strayer University as well. Uh, board certified in geriatric care, and uh, certified pain educator, and also a certified tobacco treatment specialist. I started out my pharmacy career uh, with CVS Health uh, and then moved onward to Humana Healthcare uh, and then landed uh, with uh, WVU, West Virginia University School of Pharmacy. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, blessings in, in my professional career to work on uh, programs such as the Safe and Effective Management of Pain uh, program and also our state pain management guidelines. I've uh, had the opportunity to consult as a CDC grant reviewer, a professional journalist reviewer, a civil and criminal expert witness for cases, and currently I'm the host of the Pain Pod on the Pharmacy Podcast Network uh, with an international audience of a lot of you. Uh, but Passions lie, of course, professionally speaking, with uh, pain management, uh, substance use disorder, addiction, and patient care and education for healthcare professionals and society alike. Now, that's all well and good, but here's a little visual version of this guy. So, uh, like I mentioned, walking back here at Brawl, uh, graduated from Pitt uh, and now work at WVU. Uh, also across the pond, way across the pond over in Italy, family has a vineyard. It's the Girl Flea Vineyard that you're seeing here. And one of our things that we love to do is go fishing with our uh, toddler, uh, Luke, having a little bit of fun there uh, fishing the pond with a fountain because you got to have fun in life, right? Now, as far as disclosures, I do have to mention I have no actual or potential conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, and this activity was developed by Achieve CE free of any commercial support. And as far as our learning objectives here for pharmacists today, uh, we're going to first want to recall cannabinoid history, products, and legality efforts. And also to identify opportunities for patient counseling centered on drug interactions, side effects, and the effects of marijuana cannabinoid utilization. And finally, to identify cannabinoid utilization opportunities for various medical conditions based on its respective pharmacology. And very similarly, uh, when it comes to pharmacy technician learning objectives today, we want to first be able to recall cannabinoid history, products, and legality efforts. And then to be able to recall drug interactions, side effects, and the effects of marijuana cannabinoid utilization. And finally, to identify cannabinoid utilization opportunities for various medical conditions based on its respective pharmacology. Now, folks, words matter. Spelling and grammar are vital, too. But words really matter. Uh, there's a lot of terminology out there that really leads us all, everyone in society, not just healthcare professionals and certainly yours truly as well. Uh, we, we just get down a road of confusion. So words out there like cannabis, marijuana, weed, hemp, THC, CBD, and the list goes on. But really, what's at the core of what we need to know? Well, we are pharmacy professionals, not farmers, unless you spell it with a PH, right? So we got to put on our, our botanist hats here for a moment, but you know, keeping life simple as well. Plants are all in the kingdom of plantae. Okay? And then you go through the various uh, classifications here of all plants. Well, we want to hone in really on the final two, the genus and species. So when we're talking anything of all those words on that previous slide, it all comes down to cannabis. We, we make things complicated with various other terms, but it's all about cannabis. That's the genus. 
And then the species, that's where it gets a little bit more specific, obviously. We see two of the most common cannabis species here towards the right. We have sativa, typically a a taller plant, uh, typically at its core containing more CBD, not really having a concern or a desire uh, for THC content. Again, in a core type of cannabis sativa. And then we have cannabis indica. Here we're noticing these leaves uh, made popular even in the 1990s with the Dr. Dre label of chronic. Uh, So another terminology idea here. But uh, indica, that's where we're typically at the core plant uh, having that THC content. And that's really important. But, you know, we also have to remember hybrids exist and they are a plentiful. Just like tomatoes, there's beefsteak, there's Roma, there's all the rest. And there's hybrids in between uh, because they're plants. And today we have a lot of ambiguity as far as the different uh, hybrid formulations of cannabis. So let's go uh, take our botanist hats off and go through a quick rundown here of uh, general cannabis history. Certainly not all inclusive, but some of the big things. So all the way back in the 1600s, we even had uh, Washington, Jefferson, Adams were known growers of hemp. Again, we're thinking cannabis here, folks. Uh, King James actually ordered every colonist to cultivate and export 100 hemp plants to England. That was in 1619. Hemp was actually legal tender in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland. Consider that like, like compared to wampum, the clamshells. Good golly. And cannabis was actually in U.S. tinctures and medicines all the way back in the 1600s. And here we are navigating back to that concept today. Skip forward to 1920s. Uh, the U.S. companies would sell cannabis extract for medicinal use. In fact, approximately 6% of all drugs contain cannabis. Wow. Imagine that today. Uh, also, Mexico banned the production, sale, and recreational use of cannabis 100 years ago. Oh, good golly. Uh, 29 U.S. states outlawed marijuana around that same time in that decade as well, too. Then we had a very important one here, the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act. Marijuana is actually a term derived from Mexican Spanish. It's a stigmatic term, lo and behold. Uh, You see uh, the taxes, uh, transfers of marijuana like narcotics came from this. So financially, uh, government came into play here. Farmers could purchase the $1 tax stamps to grow, as you see highlighted here to the right, and prescribers and dispensers were taxed on sales. My, what a different time, almost a century ago. Then in 1971, we had the Wallows come about with 420, the term that uh, is universally known for uh, cannabis or marijuana utilization. Uh, that started out in California, high school students gathering at about 420 in the afternoon after like soccer practice or something or other, uh, out by this Louis Pasteur statue, as you see here. And then uh, that ended up in the magazine High Times, and it was glorified everywhere to know 420 is talking about cannabis utilization. Then in 1996, California legalized quote-unquote medical marijuana, starting the cascade across our country. In 2014, the DA had a $1 budget restriction for the uh, the, the actual uh, emphasis, the enforcement of the fact that uh, cannabis or marijuana is known as a C1 in our country. And that continues to be renewed within Congress, of course. So that actually helps out with some of the questions of, well, if it's illegal, then how could it be all over the place? All comes down to enforcement. Can't get much with a buck, right? Uh, in 2016, uh, the DA actually did review and confirm marijuana classification as a C1. Uh, they were emphasizing the idea of the generally accepted medical use. Um, it's you know kind of like in uh, sports, whether it's football, baseball, whatever. If, if people don't like the rule, it, it, it's hard to not blame the umpire or the ref, right? Uh, but we do anyway, right? Uh, where they're reading it by the the way that it's stated. You no know, generally accepted medical use is society there yet? That's you know, a good question for all of us to ponder. And then, of course, in 2018, there was the Agricultural Improvement Act. Uh, That was a farm bill uh, allowing hemp to have uh, with uh, as long as it was less than 0.3 percent THC in it. Now, beyond all that history, uh, the cannabis is the concept is all throughout our society every day. There's books. Here's High Times, a magazine. There's books and books and books about marijuana, cannabis, weed. You see all the titles here, but let's concentrate on cannabis, of course. Uh, so you could check out some of these, but lots of different literature, uh, you know, in your local or online bookstore. And of course, there's a lot of uh, movies and TV talking about whether it's marijuana utilization or really drugs in general. Uh, but we have Drugs Incorporated. There, uh, even uh, more recently too, there was Hamilton's Pharmacopeia. You got movies here like Pineapple Express, Days and Confused, The Big Lebowski, Reefer Madness. Two versions of that actually. Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, Half Baked, Cheech and Chong's Up and Smoke. Good golly, all uh, revolving around marijuana utilization. 
And then, of course, we had uh, Netflix Recovery Boys uh, here in my own state, uh, where it was uh, discussed in there as well, concentrating mostly on opioid utilization, but also marijuana along the way. And, of course, Lord of the Rings. Wait, what? Well, yeah, Lord of the Rings, the ring, the ring, the precious ring, the cocaine, the marijuana, the precious marijuana. Yeah, the whole story is about addiction the whole time. Who knew, right? Well, um, also we have songs within our society. We could have lots more of these slides, folks, but let's hone in on those talking about cannabis or marijuana utilization towards the bottom and green here, of course. Uh, we got hits from the bong, Because I Got High, Gin and Juice, How High, Mary Jane, Do It, and so on and so forth from these artists. Uh, it, there's times when we're, you know, the jingles are in our head and we don't even realize that it's talking about drug utilization and specifically in this case, marijuana. And there's times that we do know. Um, you know, when you have a term like because I got high, I think it's pretty straightforward. But other times, not so much along the way. Now, here's a funky way of looking at things as well within our society. Uh, is this uh, cannabis various forms all over the place? Well, here's uh, just looking at the business aspects. Uh, in, in comparing uh, retail marijuana stores compared to Starbucks and McDonald's, all in numbers, things that are all throughout our society. And you can see there's differences here. I mean, as far as retail marijuana stores, you can see in, in Portland, Oregon and Denver, there's certainly more of those compared to even Starbucks and McDonald's, which we see on every corner, right? Um, whereas things are a little bit different, perhaps in Seattle, uh, respectively, of course, where Starbucks started. Uh, and then even Alaska, all out, not necessarily in the middle of nowhere, um, but in Anchorage. Um, yeah, a little bit more leveling there, but food for thought here overall. The point being, of course, that, uh, you know, these cannabis products are out there and we as healthcare professionals need to be uh, knowledgeable about that. Now, we also see a lot of headlines talking about taxes and how all the money that can, will and is being made off of whether it's medical or recreational marijuana and the taxes with that. Uh, you know, I always like to say all sides of the coin. There's certainly, as you see here, millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that can be made on taxes. Yes. But you also got to look at the other side of the coin where typically that's less than 1% of a state's budget because they're working with big numbers, lots of zeros, right? So again, trying to show both sides of the coin here. And then, of course, we have the trends in our country. As I mentioned earlier, 1996, California had started the ball rolling here uh, with legalization along the way. Uh, and then here we are, um, you know, as far as as most up to date as we can do uh, to see the various efforts, different shades of green. You can check out what they're talking about, whether, quote unquote, medical or recreational decriminalize and so on and so forth. Uh, the vast majority of states across our country. Also of note, this reference that I provided here is for this map, and it's it's one of the most updated, nothing's perfect, but one of the most updated resources for the changing laws so we could really keep up to date with the landscape across our country when it comes to cannabis. Now, we, uh, when going over the cannabis history there, we talked about how the uh, DEA made the decision to keep it a C1 a couple years back. And again, the, the idea there is the, uh, the idea of no generally accepted medical use. Uh, so it's in the same boat in our country as heroin. Uh, is that the best answer in the end? Well, you know, psychically, uh, you know, we're healthcare professionals, not psychic. Who knows where we're going? We can certainly uh, guesstimate. Uh, but uh, this is one way of classifying things, especially when it comes to cannabis products. This is one way. But we want to, as healthcare professionals, look even further. So one way to look further, of course, is the therapeutic index. You know, therapeutic index, the difference between what will help you and hurt you. The larger the bar here, the more wiggle room for dosing. If something is dosed of note again both sides of every coin as you can see here the uh, right at the top is marijuana basically cannabis uh, so it has that more wiggle room the wider therapeutic index so it's certainly nowhere near the realm of uh, our narrow therapeutic index uh, medications like warfarin levothyroxine and so forth and so forth uh, but interesting way of looking at things here, um, more clinically per se. Uh, one that might catch your eye here is nutmeg. Yes, it has hallucinogen in, in it, uh, miristis. And, and uh, you know, what's in our typical pantries isn't necessarily a dose that will get us in a Shakespeare play. But um, it is, again, we're concentrating here on mechanisms and then also this uh, dose overall that matters. Because, as the father of toxicology said, Paracelsus that is, I paraphrase him to say it's all about the dosage, baby. What did he actually say? All things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes the thing not a poison. Whether it's apples, pears, potatoes, zucchinis, water, coffee, whatever, too much can hurt. In essence, it's all about the dosage, baby.
Now, what about beyond the dosage? So here we're talking, and we've already, you know, the idea of mechanisms and then dose, but what else? Availability. So uh, Nora Volkow had a, a very sobering thought here uh, that she, when she was doing a, a talk one time. And um, here I'll actually just read this for us because it's, it's important to get the whole picture. Uh, she says, so the effects of a drug, whether legal or illegal, on individual health are determined not only by its pharmacological properties, but also by its availability and social acceptability. Hmm. In this respect, legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco, offer a sobering perspective accounting for the greatest burden of disease associated with drugs, not because they are more dangerous than illegal drugs, but because their legal status allows for more widespread exposure. Very sobering thoughts when you think about it. So let's kind of make that a little bit more visual for us. So in our country, uh, drugs account for approximately annually, recently anyway, 70,000 overdose deaths a year. Now, during COVID, that actually uh, amped up to 93,000. So yes, every seven minutes, an American dies statistically on average from a drug overdose. And it becomes every six minutes during COVID. However, take a look at alcohol-related deaths, 100,000 every year. Tobacco-related deaths, half a million every year. Marijuana, three. Wait, what? And there's resources for 18 as well, too. We'll go further here. But, well, is it all about just the over, the overdose deaths? Let's go further here on the marijuana concept. Well, there was two deaths uh, for cardio issues back in 2014 and one death due to dehydration in 2018. It was actually that hyperemesis syndrome we'll cover. Were there additional unreported or undiagnosed as well, too? Uh, there always can be. Uh, even if it doubled, though, we're still in single digits, right? There's other reports that would show even, I believe, 18 over the course of the most recent years. But again, nowhere compared to 70,000, 100,000, or half a million uh, when talking about drugs, alcohol, or tobacco, respectively. However, again, other side of the coin. In 2011, SAMHSA and the Drug Abuse Warning Network, or Don, estimated almost half a million marijuana-related emergency room ER visits across the U.S. So it's not necessarily the overdose death, but half a million ER visits that were related to marijuana. Again, both sides of the coin here, folks. All right, so let's take a breather and do our first poll question. Which of the following has the most related deaths related to its utilization? A, alcohol, B, drugs, C, opioids, D, tobacco. You got it. The answer to our first poll question of which of the following has the most related deaths related to utilization is D, tobacco, approximately half a million every year. All right, so let's now uh, pivot to going over the endocannabinoid system or ECS and cannabinoids. You know, for some reason, we cover all, as you see here on the right, all the systems of our body and anatomy and physiology and various classes, even in, in high school and whatnot and so forth. But endocannabinoid system kind of lagging behind. It's real, it's there, and it overlaps with other systems. There's lots of effects. So here today, first and foremost, let's go a little bit deeper, um, perhaps a little bit beyond the surface of what we're seeing within the endocannabinoid system in our bodies. So first and foremost, a little terminology along the way, or as I have here, ABC cannabinoids. <laughs> uh, there's CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors. How do we remember those? Well, it's kind of like alpha and beta. We made ones and twos and so forth. Um, here's how I remember it anyway. The physical number one, when it's on a piece of paper or on your screen, is very vertical and narrow, whereas two is wider than one. Where I'm going with that is that CB1 receptors are primarily in the CNS, so like the spine, so going up and down in the body, whereas CB2, the number two is wider, so that's typically peripherally in the immune system and GI tract. Hopefully that helps. Then we have, of course, fatty acid binding proteins or FABBs, uh, and then G-couple proteins and G-couple protein receptors. Uh, nothing new here within the endocannabinoid system. We see uh, GCPRs elsewhere as well. Uh, and then we have transient receptor potential subfamily B member one. Whew, let's call them uh, trip Vs uh, or, or TRP Vs. And then we have peroxisome proliferator activated receptors. Let's call them PPARs or PPARs. And then we haven't fun with the alphabet yet. Get out the cans of soup, right? Um, DAG becomes 2AG via, two, via DAGL alpha. So uh, 2AG is degraded to arachidonic acid and glycerol by MAGL. What do we get from all that? Ooh, 
arachidonic acid. More to come, folks. And then we have NAEP becoming uh, an andamide. And an andamide is degraded to arachidonic acid and ethanolamine by FAAH. What we have here, oh, there we go with the arachidonic acid again. We'll get there. But here we have multiple areas of the endocannabinoid system that not only have effect within our human bodies, but also could be targets for therapy in the future. Now, I know that was an insanely quick rundown of the endocannabinoid system, but we want to respect everyone's time here, too. Now, arachidonic acid came up a couple times. What we want to remember there is how that uh, affects uh, or has effects within the human body, even with over-the-counter products like NSAIDs and whatnot. So are NSAIDs cannabinoid cousins? Hmm? Do we have COX activity or is it just arachidonic acid itself? Uh, you know, more to come on the research. We're getting more light on this, but when, uh, when talking about things like glaucoma and whatnot, perhaps that comes into play or, uh, pain management as well, just like NSAIDs, more to come in research, uh, across the globe, really. And lo and behold, uh, cannabinoids also have action within the GABA general area, the presynaptic, postsynaptic area and the cleft in between. Uh, that's where we're getting some of that CB1, CB2 receptor action. Uh, so we're thinking there, uh, well, just like gabapentinoids per se, but then also where things like alcohol, benzos, and so on and so forth have action as well too. Uh, so perhaps that's some of the understanding in the background of where we're getting some of the reported effects that are observed uh, with cannabinoids. All right, this, this is going to get complicated, but also aims at simplification. So what we're getting, going for here is the fact that uh, all of these relevant, most known cannabinoids, whether THC, CBD, CBN, CBG, all stem from CBGA. Cannabigerolic acid, CBGA. So that CBGA can uh, basically be decarboxylated to be CBG. That's kind of a new, relatively newer known cannabinoid. Or CBGA uh, can end up being uh, CBD through a double process as well, cannabidiol. Or CBGA can become THC through another double process, tetrahydrocannabinol. Or uh, it could even end up being CBN or cannabinol. So that's our big kind of heavy hitters as far as uh, cannabinoids and just wanted to show everyone how they're related and how it all comes back to CBGA. And here's my attempt at simplifying how uh, the cannabinoid receptor affinity rolls for our two main cannabinoids, THC and CBD. So THC is a partial agonist for CB1, whereas CBD is an antagonist for CB1. All right, so let's get into this CBD. We see it everywhere, right? No matter where you drive and where you, wherever you walk. So cannabidiol, CBD, was discovered in 1940. As far as mechanisms of action, we got a lot going on here. Uh, indirect CB1 antagonist, as we mentioned. Uh, it's a GPR18 partial agonist and 55 antagonist, PPAR um, agonist, a selective serotonin agonist, and also reported possibly as a mu or delta opioid modulator. Not the same as agonism there, folks. Um, bioavailability is uh, certainly more upon inhalation compared to oral. Uh, Half-life uh, ranging from uh, 18 hours to 32 hours. Uh, we have the medicinal structure here for you. And of uh, note, CBD derived from hemp. And that's when, you know, the product, the cannabis product with uh, less than or equal to 0.3% THC. Uh, but uh, CBD derived from hemp is legal to sell as a cosmetics ingredient, but cannot be sold under federal law in food or dietary supplements. So we got to keep that in mind, especially with all the products that are out there these days. So how do, I, I get this often from a lot of people of like, how do we talk to people about uh, making selections for shopping for CBD products? Uh, well, Consumer Reports, the magazine, actually took care of that for us. So here's a running list. I'm not going to run through all of them here for you, but just kind of a reference and conversational point. But Consumer Reports took care of that for consumers. Uh, and the bottom line here, one of the big things is always uh, having people ask for a COA. That's a Certificate of Analysis. That's how the testing is done on these products. Now, speaking about CBD products, let's go a little bit deeper, the different types. Three big ones here, full spectrum, broad spectrum, and CBD isolate. So CBD full spectrum that's created from the plant, not manufactured synthetically. It contains other cannabinoids and trace amounts of THC. So full spectrum. Whereas broad spectrum contains other cannabinoids, but not THC. Then CBD isolate, you probably guessed this one by the name. It's a chemical extraction of CBD from plant materials to remove THC, terpenes, chlorophyll, and so forth. So you're getting more of the isolate along the way. Big differences there that we really need to know as healthcare professionals. 
And furthermore, especially as healthcare professionals and even in pharmacies, of course, uh, there's a lot of topical products that are out there and sometimes readily available in pharmacies as well. Uh, of note, uh, human skin cannabinoid absorption rates are very low. It's more for CBD compared to THC, but generally very low. Um, higher CBD topical concentration will obviously aid in the local absorption, but you know, typically uh, people will have to apply topical CBD products generously. We're thinking like Baywatch here, like with the zinc oxide all over the place, right? Um, and they may work peripherally, but not absorb into the bloodstream, but nothing new there. That's what we know about with topical products, generally speaking, anyway. But very important for us pharmacy professionals to know this. All right, so we talked about CBD. Let's get onward here to tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. Check out that structure. Very similar to CBD, right? Just seeing that extra hydrogens there because of the tetra, right? Um, but generally speaking, it's delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol. Uh, we're seeing more and more reports and information out there for other deltas like delta eight and so forth. Uh, sometimes different effects expected or observed. So THC mechanisms of action, CB1 partial agonist, as we mentioned earlier in the more visual slide. Uh, when it comes to inhalation for THC, there's immediate absorption, and the peak is usually 15 to 30 minutes. Whereas with oral ingestion, the effects are delayed 30 minutes to an hour. Peaks later as well, too, for two to three hours. Huge, huge point to talk about with people in our communities as healthcare professionals. If someone is used to uh, that immediate absorption of inhalation, uh, that means if they're taking the brownie or the gummy, uh, you got to wait a little bit longer. Don't take more of that product to get the effect. It will happen a little bit later. Also, THC is highly lipophilic, which basically means it's going to distribute rapidly to highly perfused tissues and later to fat tissue. That'll come into play for things like even uh, urine drug monitoring or urine drug screening specifically of uh, chronic utilization of uh, THC uh, products or cannabis or whatnot uh, could actually uh, be around much longer because of that highly uh, because of being highly lipophilic. All right, so let's get down with some of these terms here, okay, for THC. The combustible products, let's talk about that first. There's, of course, a joint. I know you've heard of joints. They're small, portable. Uh, it's cannabis rolled inside a thin rolling paper. Uh, often have a crutch or a filter. Whereas a blunt, that's cannabis inside a cigar or a blunt wrap, of course. Uh, wraps are typically made out of tobacco, so you're going to have that stimulant effect there as well, too. They're typically, uh, they're bigger than joints and last a lot longer. Then, finally, there's a spliff. That's like a joint, but as tobacco and cannabis mixed together. Uh, it allows a personalization of the tobacco to cannabis ratio. So we've got joints, blunts, and spliffs. All right, so when talking about those combustible products, we'll go a little bit deeper here for papers. Um, you got to keep in mind there's the amount of cannabis that can change depending on the size of the paper, so how much you can fit in there. Uh, when it comes to the papers, there could also be flavor. Uh, so tobacco papers are notably sweeter than hemp paper overall. And then uh, how something will burn. Thicker paper burns slower than thinner papers, obviously, but that's something that people take into account. Uh, there's also the hemp or rice or paper in general that will affect the burn overall. And then we have our hashish or hash oil extract. So not, not necessarily always combustible here, but all right. What, what's this hashish? It's isolated marijuana resin. It's typically dark colored gummy balls, as you see here. Then we have hash oil in the extracts and you want know, to get to them. Generalized process here would be to boil the plant, filter out the solids, vaporize all the water, leaving this hash oil, as you hopefully see here. Uh, that's where we get some of our extracts that are available as well, too, via a generalized process like that. Now, when talking about those types of products, I like to go over this little conversation here for us. Can you spot the pot? Now, of course, my cap out here is right in the middle with that nice shiny red pot, right? Dutch oven. Uh, but actually, the gummies, the brownies, the muffins, the drinks, the pizza, the pot tarts, all of them contain what we can call pot. Again, this terminology is all over the place, but cannabis uh, products, uh, typically the, the extracts or oils along the way. And again, again, a very, very important point here. Um, if somebody is going along the routes of the edibles, we have to tell them the basics. Like it's going to take longer uh, compared to inhalation of the combustible products for the effect to hit. Do not take more because uh, that's how people end up in the ER a lot. Then check this out. We have laced marijuana. Well, first off, there's Love Boat, which is marijuana laced with formaldehyde. Yes, embalming fluid. There's the brain. Then there's this KD. Don't know if you heard of this one, but marijuana or tobacco that's laced with a bug spray, uh, parathroids. So what's happening here is people are taking a cannabis, marijuana, uh, spraying it with like Rage or something, and then smoking it and walking around like zombies. Of note, doing this on purpose. 
Now, if we ever need an in our faces, present self included understanding of substance use disorder or addiction or whatever's going on with substance abuse even, here it is. To go to the point of spraying something with rage, smoking it to walk around like a zombie is very profound to get all of us thinking about what's going on in someone's mind. Now, as far as some of the synthetic uh, cannabinoids, uh, first up we have here the terminology of Scooby Snacks. So here's the Scooby Snack market, okay? On the left here, you got the Graham Cracker Sticks. And they're almost like uh, made for s'mores or something, but not. Tastes pretty darn good. Uh, let's skip over that funky looking one. Then we've got the gummy ones, the fruit gummy ones. There, you know, what, what toddler doesn't want those, right? Then of note, be careful. There's also actual dog snacks. So those ones all the way to the right, that's for dogs, not for humans. Okay. Uh, then let's get back to Scooby looking a little bit funky with his tongue out. Now that's Scooby snacks. That's a, a terminology that means synthetic marijuana has nothing to do with marijuana. It's actually just, you know, the synthetic cannabinoid is sprayed onto the green leaves. Think like oregano and whatnot, but not actually. Uh, and here we have a myriad of listings of other uh, synthetic marijuana nicknames as well, in addition to Scooby Snacks like K2 Spice and so on and so forth. But got to know these things, folks. And then as healthcare professionals, you know, how do we even attempt to help people, especially when it comes to recommended uh, dosing and whatnot? So for THC towards the top here, it really depends on the person's uh, cannabis experience, whether they're naive or a daily to weekly utilizer or multiple times a day. And then the THC general, very approximate, just a guide here, uh, daily dose can go as, as seen here. Uh, and then we also have CBD practical daily dosing as well, where it's a, kind of a wide range, quite frankly. But again, re, uh, information on this is so in, incredibly hard to find because nothing ever gets published in this regard, um, given the nature of things across the globe. Uh, but of note, other side of the coin, uh, without regulation, our product contents are not absolute. Thus, there may be overlap. So we got to keep that in mind. Again, trying to show all sides of the coin here. All right, so speaking of synthetic cannabinoids, let's go over our prescription products here, just a few. Uh, first, we have the CBD or cannabidiol product, Epidiolix. It's actually approved for those at least two years of age for Dravet syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, and LGS, all forms of basically seizure scenarios. You know, this we're talking here uh, young children having multiple, many, many seizures a day, and then this cannabinoid prescription, FDA-approved product, uh, makes it so that those no longer happen. Huge. And then, of course, many are familiar. It's been around for much longer, but the C2 products of uh, THC, uh, those being dronabinol or marinol capsules, and then syndrose being the liquid. I have the pictures here for us, uh, but the FDA approvals are for chemo-induced nausea and vomiting or AIDS and anorexia. Off-label, often uh, observed to be used for uh, cancer, anorexia, uh, intractable pruritus, secondary to cholestatic liver disease, uh, as far as what uh, on clinical pharmacology online database would say as well, too. And, you know, off-label, it's like many other medicines, there's uh, a lot of other utilizations as well, too. Even just observationally, sometimes uh, there's the wondering of whether it could be utilized for neuropathic pain and, and so on and so forth for others. But big picture, cannabinoid prescription product. And then, of course, this is a combination. And here's CBD and THC, otherwise known as Sativex. Uh, this is not currently approved in America. It's approved for MS spasticity in over two dozen countries, including Canada, Mexico, Europe, everybody around us and away from us. Uh, it's approved for MS neuropathic pain and cancer pain in Canada as well. Uh, we've got phase three style uh, clinical trials for all of the above. The dosage, uh, each spray contains 2.7 milligrams of THC and 2.5 milligrams of CBD. Uh, the the utilized uh, dose titration for sprays, starting with one spray a day up to 12 a day. Uh, so coming to shelves possibly near you. And finally, we have uh, Nabilone or Sesamet. Uh, and these are capsules that are a C2 and they're approved for chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. All right, let's take a little time out here and do our second pool question. Which of the following prescription cannabinoid products are FDA approved for seizure conditions? A, Nabixamols or Sativex. B, Nabilone or Sesamet, C, Cannabidiol or Epidiolex, or D, Dronabinol, Marinol. And of course, the answer for the FDA approved product for seizure conditions as a cannabinoid uh, is C, cannabidiol or epidiolex. All right, folks. So what else do we as healthcare professionals need to know when it comes to can cannabinoid or cannabis uh, pharmacology 
considerations. You know, really big picture things, but let's go over these to really be able to help our patients. So first and foremost, of course, one of the things as pharmacy professionals we're always considering is adverse effects or side effects. Nothing new here, I'm sure, but uh, disorientation, dizziness, get high in the highest odds ratio in this reference. And then things like dry mouth, euphoria, drowsiness, confusion, balance issues. And then lower on there would be hallucinations, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and fatigue. Um, but I, I think most of people in society are familiar with uh, especially THC side effects, perhaps not necessarily CBD, but these are in general for cannabinoids overall. Now, very, very important, especially as pharmacy professionals, uh, drug, drug interactions. So CBD products and THC products, as we have listed here with CYP450 hepatic enzyme uh, concerns uh, involving 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 3A4, and 2D6. Can you think of any medications that would interact with those or have an effect with those? Yes. Darn near all of them, right? Especially 3A4, right? Uh, but that's the big picture here is, uh, you know, being able to look for these drug drug interactions for, um, you know, even people utilizing CBD products or THC in general. First and foremost, we got to ask our patients these questions. Is there any utilization of any substances, uh, you know, otherwise uh, beyond prescription over the counter dietary supplements and whatnot? Then once the question is asked, then what we got to look through their general medication list to see if there's any interactions. Um, those prescription uh, cannabinoid products that we talked about can really help with that in online data databases for checking for drug-drug interactions because you could utilize, say, something like Epidiolex for CBD or Dronabinol for THC to check for drug-drug interactions as a, a more relatively reliable source overall. And wouldn't it be great if we had more information on this? Um, you know, perhaps if the if the utilization of cannabis was included somehow, some way, thinking big picture here, folks, in our prescription drug monitoring programs, wouldn't we want to know if someone's getting a controlled substance, let's say a prescription opioid, and there was also a cannabinoid in utiliz being utilized? It's no judgment per se whatsoever on a personal side, but on the professional side, we want to be able to make those decisions in the big picture. So perhaps someday, somewhere. Now, as far as cannabinoid utilizations in, in clinical practice, this was actually one of our learning objectives, but the other idea here, here's a very, very large and thorough uh, American Heart Association of all groups uh, review article. Uh, going over various cannabinoid utilizations, uh, grouping them by inconclusive evidence for, for use, possible moderate evidence, or known conclusive substantial evidence for the clinical utilization of cannabinoids. So I'm not going to read through all the inconclusive evidence, but the list is long, as you can see here. For possible utilization, that would be the long-term opioid utilization, dystonia, and glaucoma. Hmm, there's that glaucoma again. Just possible, though. Whereas this article says that there's known conclusive or substantial evidence for the utilization of cannabinoids uh, for pain, that would be neuropathic fibromyalgia or cancer, uh, cachexia, nausea and vomiting, multiple sclerosis, and epilepsy. Those were That's where the known evidence is there. But again, other side of the coin, we also have to know what's in the products. And here's a big one that gets me as far as headlines uh, all across our country, but we'll see many headlines that say, you know, in states that legalize, quote unquote, medical marijuana, uh, prescription opioid utilization decreases. OK, uh, but uh, other studies then go a step further for the big picture question of saying, OK, in states that legalize, med quote unquote, medical marijuana, uh, opioid overdose deaths increase. So kind of leaves us dazed and confused here of less opioids, but more opioid overdoses. Well, it's because there's a lot of other stuff going on in the world, right? Correlation does not necessarily mean causation. Again, trying to go on all sides of the coin here. I want to correct the headlines that are out there, but also go a step further there. We've got to look at the big picture of everything that's going on in this society, not just one factor. All right, so let's go over some of the general medical topics when it comes to cannabinoids in general. Uh, so cannabis, cannabinoids, and pregnancy. Here's here's some um, facts that are out there. Uh, women who utilize uh, cannabis or cannabinoids during pregnancy, uh, the moms are more likely to be anemic. The babies are more likely to have a lower birth weight. Babies are more likely to require the NICU. And babies displayed altered responses to visual stimuli or high-pitched cry. The link between prenatal exposure and school years, uh, there was impulse control issues, visual memory, attention issues, and so on and so forth. Of note, THC is excreted in breast milk. All right, now here's a, another one here, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, or CHS. Imagine a time when somebody wants to take like a dozen hot showers in a day, and it's because they can't stop puking. 
Well, that's one way to describe this. It involves those trip B receptors, TRPV receptors, perhaps kind of like uh, maybe someday something like capsaicin. You know, we originally thought it to work with substance P, but now we know or we believe we know that it's working on those TRPV receptors as well. So maybe capsaicin would be a treatment instead of taking many house showers. But we're not there yet. Studies need to be done for that. Uh, but big picture, this is an important thing to keep in mind, clinically speaking. And then, of course, we have marijuana compared to tobacco. Uh, as far as carcinogens, there's 50% more benzopyrene, 75% more benzanthracene, uh, and a lot more phenols, chlorides, nitros, means, and oxidants, a lot more carcinogens. That's the biggest picture here when it comes to cannabis marijuana. Uh, the tar concerns, there's actually deeper inhalations, and there, those inhalations are held longer. So you get four times, on average, four times the tar deposition um, with marijuana compared to tobacco huge concerns when we're talking about the combustion. And then, of course, we have marijuana and alcohol, ethyl alcohol ponderings. So of note, marijuana use coincides with alcohol use, not one or the other. In fact, uh, for some data, Colorado alcohol sales increased in 2014. That's when there was recreational marijuana legalization uh, through 2018. Spirits, with that, which had that higher potency, increased by about 8%. Beer had a lower uh, potent, relative potency, and that decreased by 4%. So there was a higher utilization of the higher potency things. Wine of note remained steady. Um, I guess that was left for uh, California and some other countries, right? But keep that in mind where it's both together, not exclusive of each other. And then uh, perhaps last but not least, there's the infamous gateway drug, question mark. So let's go over some of the facts that are out there. And the references are here, but uh, cannabis use is associated with increased non-medical prescription opioid use. Whoa, that escalated quickly. Cannabis use is also associated with increased opioid use disorder, building on that last statement. 9% of those who experiment will progress to cannabis use disorder or cannabis addiction. 17% of adolescent first-time utilizers will progress to cannabis use disorder or cannabis addiction. 25 to 50% of those daily utilizers will also progress to cannabis addiction. And of note here on this visual uh, chart here, what we're seeing is the difference between the blue and the orange line. So blue lines daily utilization of cannabis products, and then the orange is the perceived risk thereof. When risk perceived risk is down, utilization is up. When perceived risk is up, utilization is down. So messaging matters. And almost last but not least, here is the idea of all the uh, marijuana or really cannabis research across our country. So here's a listing of uh, various resources when it comes to where research is being done uh, with cannabis products. Uh, of note, the University of Mississippi uh, is the sole source of federal research marijuana plants in our country, the United States of America. Uh, and the potency thereof is more like it was decades ago, being much lower than what we actually have observations of in the streets and uh, life these days. So in reality, where do we go from here? Bottom line, really. So this slide and the next one is actually going to go over some recommendations from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, or ASAM. First up is going to be the medical cannabis purpose recommendations, and then we'll have the non-medical recommendations. So first up here with medical purpose recommendations, <clears throat> ASAM says that uh, cannabis should be rescheduled from Schedule 1. Uh, there should be FDA review and approval. Healthcare professionals should have specific training. Here we are, right? There should be a patient-clinician relationship, and there should uh, always be screening and only recommend if potential benefits outweigh potential harms, risk versus benefit. And there, no one should ever recommend cannabis use for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Uh, and there should be health department oversight, not legislature or re public referenda. And there should be PDMP reporting and review. Uh, there should be mandated potency labeling. And there should be a discouragement of combustion or vaporization. And there should be expanded research uh, and research cannabis uh, and FDA approved medication development uh, even more so than we have already. So there's the ASAM recommendations on the medical side. And then uh, relatively similar, but on the non-medical purpose side, so recreational or whether it's decriminalization or whatever, ASAM recommends that uh, public health education efforts uh, and uh, avoid distribution to anyone under the age of 21. Uh, there should be decriminalization with civil fines and fees uh, that will be eliminated. Instead, utilize clinical referral. There should be expungement for past minor cannabis-related convictions. There should be a Controlled Substance Act amendment. Uh, there should uh, be a use of models other than commercialization, such as limiting production, marketing, and sale, getting into the supply chain. 
and uh, having a strong public health based regulatory framework and health messages should be against the use with mental illness and pregnancy and warn of impaired driving risk. Huge one. Uh, there should be a limit on potency. Uh, and there should be substantial cannabis tax revenue uh, percent earmarked to fund prevention and mitigation of cannabis related harm, substance use disorder prevention and treatment programs and enforcement of the actual laws. And of course, there should be healthcare professional training. Here we are. Uh, and avoid discontinued use while pregnant or contemplating pregnancy. And pregnant women decide whether or not to provide consent for cannabis testing during labor and delivery. And of course, future resource. So that's what ASAM says for the non-medical purpose recommendations. All right, so that's the where we go from here because this topic just keeps on going and, and we could probably have an 18-hour Q&A, right? Uh, but uh, lots of information out there. But from our discussion here today, so here's some of those bigger key takeaways. Uh, marijuana utilization results in few direct overdose deaths, yet a large number of emergency room visits. Hemp is allowed to have less than 0.3% THC. CB1 receptors are primarily in the CNS, whereas CB2 receptors are primarily in the immune system and GI tract on the periphery. Anandamide, or AEA, and 2-arachidonoglycerol, or 2-AG, are endocannabinoids with arachidonic acid in their structures. Very important for effects. THC is a CB1 agonist, and CBD is a CB1 antagonist. CBD and THC are involved with the CYP450 enzyme system via 1A2, 2C9, 2C19, 3A4, and 2D6. Lots of interaction concerns as possibilities there. FDA-approved cannabinoids include the CBD product Epidiolex for various seizure conditions, the THC products Gronabinol, Marinol, and Syndros for chemotherapy, nausea, and vomiting, and AIDS anorexia, and Nabilone or Sesamet for chemotherapy, nausea, and vomiting. And cannabis utilization risks include marijuana lung, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, lower birth weight babies, and marijuana use disorder addiction. 